Um, so greetings to everyone and uh, please listen to the following teachings uh, on Pedro Ramuche's perfect, the words of my perfect master um, with the proper Mahayana intention, proper Bodhisattva intention which is to an enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So today's teaching uh, is about uh, impermanence. Uh, we will talk about impermanence today. And uh, so, so for many reasons, uh, impermanence is uh, an important uh, part in an important practice. Uh, uh, um, recalling impermanence or reflecting upon impermanence is a uh, very important, uh, very important practice for practicing the. It's one of the main practices um, of all the practices that there is in the, uh, the the Dharma practice in the Buddhist practice practices. Uh, recalling impermanence or reflecting upon impermanence is one of the most important of all the practices that there is. And uh, so, um, so in order to um, reflect on uh, the impermanence, so um, the book that we are going to read today has actually uh, laid out the impermanence in seven uh, chapters or seven different. Uh, um, sections uh, <clears throat> so we will probably pr probably i'm thinking of going to the uh going to the last of the seven um chapters or the seven sections also here listed as the seven meditations so first we will start with the last one and then we will go up from there um, I think it will be more relevant and easier to understand from then onwards. Um, so <clears throat> the seven chapters of uh, the seven chapters or the seven um, sections on uh, practicing on impermanence is listed here as the impermanence of the outer universe. So outer means uh, so here when we talk about outer and inner uh, normally when we say inner we are talking about the sentient beings the people who live in the world are known as the inner uh, in that in, in tibetan we call both of them the inner um, inner world and outer world when we refer when we say inner world we are talking about ourselves and when we say the outer world we are talking about the the materials that the inner world or the the, the, the beings the human beings uh, the sentient beings uh, use uh, such as the trees, the water, all that, etc., etc. So, uh, outer universe, as in the as in the sense of uh, the world outside of us. Uh, then the inner beings, or meaning uh, the, the 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 sentient beings who actually use all the materials uh, in the world. So, the impermanence of the outer universe or the outside world, impermanence of the inner beings or the sentient beings living in that outer world, the impermanence of holy beings, um, the impermanence of those uh, holding positions of power, uh, impermanence, uh, other various other examples of impermanence, the uncertainty of uh, the circumstances of death or the causes of death, and the intense awareness, or uh, in, to, 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 to put it simply, in interest on impermanence. So these are the seven uh, meditations or seven uh, contemplations that uh, consist uh, in order to reflect upon the impermanence. Um, impermanence. Yeah. So, so. What will we what we will do here is uh, we will go to the last of the uh, seven 
meditations, uh, which is the uh, the keen interest or the um, intense awareness on impermanence. So we will uh, talk about this first. Um, then we will go uh, from from there we will go upwards. Mm -mm. For this, I will first uh, uh, I will quote a master, uh, a Kadamba master called Kishi Potowa. Uh, so this actually this quote is actually in the uh, in the book itself, in this book itself. So so there was occasion when a lay disciple asked Kishi Potowa. Uh, Kishi Potowa is a great learned uh, practitioner and a great master uh, of the Kadamba tradition. So that lay person, lay disciple, uh, so asked Kishi Potowa um, which Dharma practice is the most important one. And if they have a choice to choose only one practice, only one Dharma practice, what would that be? And uh, then the Kishi Potowa said, the Kishi replied, if you want to use a single Dharma practice, then meditate on impermanence is the most important. Because at first, meditation on death and impermanence. So, in, uh, death is a um, type. D uh, death is an aspect of impermanence. So, like when there are, uh, you know, this, uh, when there are um, small changes, we do not notice. When there are small changes, are an aspect of the impermanence. When there are small changes, we don't notice. But when there is a big change, such as death, a big change, such uh, big changes in your health, big changes in your life, big changes in your uh, career, then you ultimately you notice. So the small changes we usually uh, skip. So if you, if we are aware of impermanence, then we will be aware of the small changes. And by uh, reflecting, by 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 being aware of the small changes, we can actually uh, well, of course, we cannot reverse death, that is inevitable, but we can make good use of the time until death comes, until our uh, the last moment comes. Mm. So, mm. so, so I'm, quite, I'm, I'm quoting Geshe Potowa here. So what he said was, if you want to use a single Dharma practice uh, to meditate on impermanence is the most important. At first, meditation on death and impermanence makes you take up the Dharma. In the middle, it conduces to positive practices. Uh, in the end, it helps you realize the sameness of all phenomena. So, uh, the second line. So, uh, if you're reading the same book as mine, uh, it's on page 57. Uh, it, uh, it's on the page 57. So, read from the uh, the second the, the second paragraph, which is. Uh, so, at the f okay. So again, this, so this is a line. Uh, uh, so the second line says, "At first, meditation on impermanence make you cut your ties with the things of this life. In the middle, it conduces to your casting off all clingings to samsara. In the end, it helps you take up the path of nirvana." So the third line goes, at first meditation on impermanence makes you develop faith. In the middle, it conduces to diligence in your practice. In the end, it helps you give birth to wisdom. At first meditation on impermanence until you are fully convinced makes you search for the Dharma. In the middle, it conduces to practice. In the end, it helps you attain the ultimate goal. So there are more to follow, but uh, I think the most important part is that uh, the first line, which says, meditation on death and impermanence makes you take up the Dharma. Um, meditation on empty, uh, impermanence makes you cut your ties with all the things of this life. Uh, meditation on emptiness, uh, sorry, meditation on impermanence makes you develop faith. And the meditation on impermanence until you are fully convinced makes you search for the Dharma. So I think this is the uh, most important um, sort of uh, reasons why impermanence uh, meditation or 
Uh, reflection on impermanence is the key here. Um, so there's also a saying among practitioners that uh, if if you have meditate if you have impermanence, meaning if you uh, reflect on if you contemplate on impermanence, uh, then the the practice on Dharma will follow uh, no matter what. Um, if you don't, if you do not if you do not invest a considerable amount of time on impermanence, then your dharma practice will also your that your dharma practice in general, all the other dharma practices will also uh, crumble, will also fall off. Uh, the reason is very simple, uh, because if you understand the importance, the urgent, uh, the urgency of impermanence. Um, how fragile our lives are, how fragile uh, all the things that all, all our possessions are, how fragile our relationship is, uh, how fragile the whole world is outside as well as inside. So the moment you realize all that, uh, then you see everything that we <clears throat> so much cling on to uh, um, is so trivial. We we come to we tend to realize that until until we reflect upon the uh, nature of impermanence of all the things that we possess all the things that all the things that we cling on to uh, then we, th we we take everything for granted we take everything for granted and then we just keep on building um, we we keep on building blocks and blocks of um, structures buildings bridges, uh, cities, and, uh, you know, whatever, on, 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 uh, on ice. So the ice will melt eventually. The ice will mel melt eventually. And uh, when exactly the ice will melt, um, it's, it's complete uncertainty. Uh, yet we take everything for granted, and then we build all these things. And uh, we believe everything to be firm, firmly grounded, and we 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 we, we make buildings that to last for uh, hundreds of years. We make you know structures to uh, that can last for centuries, and so on and so forth. And uh, believing that you know we will be, even though we all know that uh, we will die one day. Nobody in our families, nobody in our generation has lived forever. You know, everyone in their family has, uh, uh, in, 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 in every family there has been a death. In every family there has been a death. Uh, and uh, yet, until it comes, to, uh, in, until, until the death comes at your own, our own doorstep, we always feel like, not me. It's not going to happen to me. Oh, one of you know, our neighbor's uh, grandmother died. My friend's uh, grand grandfather died. But uh, maybe for a few moments, we reflect upon that. We are kind of sad, sorrowful, and then we forget everything, and then we c carry on as everything is normal. Um, so the moment we realize, so that's why, uh, of course, on, a, on an intellectual level, we all know that life is impermanent you know we are not going to live more than 100 years or so uh, so that means some of us have only 20 years to live 50 years to live you know which is not very much um, if you you know think of it um, if you look at how much preparation that we have put into how much work that we have put into and uh, how much life that we have left then it you, if you put those things in a scale, uh, on two scales, so all the efforts that you have put into living and uh, the lifespan that you actually have, uh, if you compare the two, um, then you will realize that all this has been quite futile. So when you realize all these things, then you will, when you realize that, when you come into not just intellectual realization, but actual um, when you actualize it when you are able to uh, make an um, um, a realization that uh, 
this is something real impermanence is real death is real change is real and uh, nothing um, there's nothing that we can hold on to forever the, nothing solid uh, then we will begin to um, uncling ourselves we will begin to detach ourselves uh, so what we are detached to at the moment right now so at the moment we are detached to all the worldly things whether it is our relationship whether it's our um, career whether it's our position our wealth so on so whatever it is we are all um, clinging towards uh, the present life and uh, and the present life is as I said before no more than 100 years so if we are very lucky we may be we may live up to 110 20 years but even then after you cross the age of 100 then you are solely dependent upon other of course we are dependent upon other people even now but once you cross the age of 100 then you are solely dependent upon other people even to go to the toilet or you know everything and then you become more of a burden than an actually living being uh, you are not living as yourself but living open the mercy if you like of, of others so you know it, it, it's it's a burden on them it's a burden open yourself um, so so many things so my point here is that uh, it's uh, we are not going to live more than a hundred years generally speaking and uh, the preparation that we put forward in this life for this life all the things that we do um, it's we are going into the wrong direction so if you think about uh, our afterlives life after this one uh, we're not seeing do not put any input uh, don't don't invest in this life of course we have to we have to eat we have to put a roof on our house and so on and so forth but uh, it is it isn't as much as all the afterlives that we are going to have so it's more important to invest in our afterlife and this is where the practice of Dharma comes in because Dharma is not about being religious or you know being a Buddhist or being you know belonging to a certain religion uh, you know having faith <clears throat> or just clinging to one God or that kind of thing so Dharma basically means righteousness so when you when you do all the rightful things when you do all the righteous things then all the when you create causes and conditions for the righteous things then it is uh, natural that all the um, um, what's that? effects or the results the consequence will also be righteous uh, be um, uh, will be pleasant so when you sow when you sow uh, um, a righteous karma then the benefits or the consequence will also be righteous so therefore Dharma is all about being righteous and practicing Dharma reading about the Dharma actually that the, the Dharma teaches about uh, that the right way the righteous way or the right way the proper way um, to follow so that you will accumulate proper karmas to have a um, to simply put if you, in, in simple terms to have a better life not just in this lifetime but in afterlives as well and, uh, and if you are thinking in a more higher spiritual um, aspect then enlightenment um, liberation from all sufferings and so on and so forth so therefore if you reflect and if you gain realizations on impermanence then the practice of Dharma will become an urgent matter for you and then um, simply put you will do practice whatever practice you could get your hands on to you will just keep on doing that hmm. so impermanence is more or less like a you know a debt collector so if you know you are in debt and uh, there is a debt collector chasing you then of course you will do whatever you can uh, to amass wealth amass um, money so that you can pay back to your debt collector so similarly um, the 
reflecting or re reflecting upon and re gaining realization on impermanence is similar to that. So, uh, so please come to page number 56. Um, so there's a quote from Buddha himself which said, uh, to meditate persistently on impermanence is to make offerings to all the Buddhas. Um, so how does this become, uh, practicing on impermanence becomes an offering to the Buddhas? Um, so there was a, an, another quote uh, from Milarepa which says, uh, as far as material offerings are concerned, I have none. Um, so to repay the kindness of my father guru, my guru, um, I will uh, practice diligently. Mm. So this is what Milarepa said. So similarly, when you make the, uh, uh, when you practice, uh, it becomes a perfect offerings for the Buddhas or your guru, because this is you are doing exactly what you, your guru told you to do, and so of course it will make uh, the guru happy. Um, so it becomes an offering, it becomes a puja. So the puja is, a, you know, we usually talk about puja, right? Puja. So puja is a Sanskrit word which means to please. So when you do a puja, you are actually pleasing the god, the deities, the the, the teacher, whatever, whatever, whatever. So to uh, to do a puja means to please. So and uh, puja is usually uh, translated as uh, ritual or rite or whatever. But puja is actually an offering made to please someone. And so that way. Uh, to meditate persistently, so the Buddha said, to meditate persistently on impermanence is to make offerings to all the Buddhas. To meditate persistently on impermanence is to rescue uh, the Buddhas from all their sufferings. Of course, the Buddha does not have any sufferings, but what it is trying to say here is, that, what, what the, the word is uh, implying here is that uh, the Buddha are, um, you know, in a, in a, in a um, the reason Buddha is giving teachings, the Buddha, the reason Buddha taught us, the, gives us the teachings, is to liberate us. Um, so there's no way he can liberate with a snap of a finger. He can only lead, liberate us through the teachings which we have to follow. Uh, so when we follow the teachings, then the Buddha's um, th their load is off, their burden is off, and so in a way it is as we are rescuing the Buddha from their suffering. Of course, the Buddha doesn't have any suffering, any form of suffering, but, uh, you know, the suffering the Buddha has is to liberate us from samsara. So, as long as we are in samsara, the Buddhas are suffering, because, um, you know, because the Buddha wants to liberate us and we are still stuck there. So, when we start meditating on impermanence, then we are, we, we are walking away from the clutches of samsara, and so therefore we are uh, rescuing Buddhas from their sufferings. So, <clears throat> uh, to meditate persistently on impermanence is to be guided by all the Buddhas. Um, yes. To meditate persistently on impermanence is to be blessed by all the Buddhas. And this is very important also. So Buddha said, of all the, all, all, all the footprints, the footprints of the elephants are out, outstanding, the most outstanding one. Um, because elephant is the, you know, back then elephant is understood as the largest land animal in the in the world. So the elephant's footprint is the most, uh, the largest one, the most majestic one. So it's the most outstanding one. Just so, of all subjects of meditation, all of all objects of meditation, for a follower follower of the Buddha, the idea of impermanence is unsurpassed. Uh, so again, also in the Vinaya Sutra, the Buddha said, to remember for an instant the impermanence of all compounded things is greater than giving food and offerings to a hundred, hundreds of my disciples who are perfect vessel, vessels, such as Bhikshu, Sariputra, and Mo, uh, Mogalyana. So, uh, you know, uh, Shariputra and Mogalyana are like the uh, most prominent disciples of the Buddha, uh, followers of the Buddha, disciples of Buddha, they themselves, they, uh, on, they are great masters on their own right. So, reflecting for one instant on impermanence is you accumulating much more merit 
uh, accumulating more merit by by reflecting upon the impermanence than making offerings to hundreds of monks, including Shariputra and Mughalayana. So think of this thing. So how important, how meritorious it is to uh, to, to, to understand, uh, to, re, to, to reflect, to understand, to gain realization on impermanence is. We, we always make offering to the gurus, to the monasteries, to, um, and also we give lots of, uh, give alms to accumulate merit. Mm, of course it is important, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it is our hard earned money. We, 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 we toil so hard, it's our sweat, and blood. So we offered this money um, to the Sangha, to the Dharma, uh, to, 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 the, to, to the three uh, triple gem, <clears throat> and also we give uh, alms to accumulate merit. But more than all of that, if you ref reflect upon the uh, impermanence, uh, this is more merit, this, it, is, it is more meritorious. This is not something made up by myself or as anyone. Actually, the Buddha himself said in the sutras. So therefore, this is something, you know, if you have no money at all, uh, if you have no money to offer at all, if you want to make an offering, you can just reflect upon uh, impermanence and that will actually accumulate a huge amount of merit for you. If this is even if this is your goal, I mean, of course, this is not the, uh, you know, if you are a Dharma practitioner, this is not exactly your goal. Like, you know, just accumulate as much merit as you can so that you can live very happily. <laughs> there is a, there, there is a, um, um, the emotive uh, is high, far superior than that. Mm. Uh, but anyway, so, this is what the Buddha said. Uh, it is far more meritorious to uh, reflect on impermanence than to make such a huge offering to the Sangha. So uh, one might think that if you reflect on empty, uh, impermanence for so long, then you will feel as everything is futile, and then there is, you know, it, everything becomes pointless. And at the same time, uh, if you think of death, death is uncertain. You will not, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't know when you are going to die. You don't know when uh, the next disaster will, uh, will, 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 will struck upon you. And if you keep thinking of on that, you will be fearful of everything around you. And uh, then what? Right? Uh, you, will be, you will just be, you know, uh, you will be uh, remorseful. You will be, um, you know, you don't want to do anything. You will uh, lack enthusiasm in doing anything because you think everything is futile. There is nothing to do. So this is also a possibility that might happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a sort of a step-by-step -step guidance guide as to you know how to approach that. So this was. Uh, so this was from Nyame uh, Tabul Haji or Peerless Tabul Rinpoche. So Tabul Tabul Rinpoche here we refer we're referring to Master Gambuba. So he, this is one of his other names. So what he said was at first you should be. This is also I'm reading from uh, page number fifty six. At first you should be driven by a fear of birth and death like a stag escaping from a trap. Mm. Uh, in the middle, so in the beginning, there should be a fear. There should be, you know, when when a deer is chased by the tiger or by a cheetah, there is no other thoughts. They just, they just want to escape. Just want to escape. There is no other no other thoughts. They are single pointedly uh, focused on escaping the tiger, escaping the predator. So similarly, at first you should be driven by that fear. So that fear is so strong that it makes you uh, run for miles. So in the middle, you should have nothing to do, nothing to regret even if you die. So meaning, in the beginning there should be that fear, and that fear uh, for a deer, that fear propels them to run, right, for a deer. Uh, 
uh, for any animal uh, when they are chased by the predator, it propels them to run. For a Dharma practitioner, it's not running in the sense of physical uh, you know, movement, but running in the sense of running away from or distancing yourself from samsaric lifestyle, uh, for which we need the guidance of the Dharma. A again, Dharma is not about religion or you know being belonging to a certain organization, but about uh, put going on the righteous way. So if you uh, are aware of the eightfold uh, noble 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 eightfold path, there's a uh, one of which is the right uh, the right path. So <clears throat> Dharma practicing Dharma is all about following the righteous path. So when you follow the righteous path, then you have nothing to regret, even if you die. Right? Of course, we are going to die, no matter what. One time, one day, we will die. So, in the middle, because you have practiced, and uh, in the beginning, there was a fear, and that fear actually propelled you to practice. And because of the practice, in the middle, you have nothing to regret, even if you are caught, even if you are uh, caught by the predator, like a farmer who has carefully worked his fields. So. In the end, you should feel relieved and happy, like a person who has just completed a formidable task. So what we usually do is the exit opposite. We, uh, when, when, until death comes knocking at our door, we live very happily. We are relieved. We are relaxed. We, we you know, we live a complacent lifestyle. And at the time of death, we, 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 we are trapped. Uh, even if we want to run, we are. Uh, in a room with all doors locked, so we cannot run. So when there is the time, when there is the opportunity, we have to learn how to run away from samsara. We have to learn how to distance ourselves from the samsaric lifestyle, from the non-righteous lifestyle and all that. Uh, so the non-righteous lifestyle is what a dharma is. Dharma is the righteous lifestyle. A dharma is a Sanskrit word meaning non-dharma or anti-dharma. So it is not like that. It is about righteous and non-righteous. So uh, when you just in, in other words, we call them virtuous and non-virtuous. The ten virtues and the ten non-virtuous. Uh, so uh, when you just when, when we distance ourselves from when away. Uh, practices and embrace the dharma practices, virtuous practices, then we have nothing to regret in the middle. And at the time of death, when death knocks, we will be happy, we will be relieved to welcome death in. Because now death is no longer that predator which is uh, predator which is trying to eat us up and you know get rid of us, uh, uh, destroy us, but is something uh, that is going to change us completely uh, we, we look forward to death it's death becomes like a new year you know it's very new year we all look forward to new year celebration and all that um, at, at one point you know we all look forward to new years but we always um, try to avoid death so death and new year are very similar things uh, new every new year is a very um, uh, is is a it's a <clears throat> every new year is a mini version of death. Every year we are dying. Uh, we are getting a little bit closer to death, and so in that in, in 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 that sense we are dying a little bit. And if you think it that way, actually we are dying every month. We are dying every week. We are dying every day. Every moment as we breathe in and out, we are dying. So to 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 the mini death, which is a new year, we look forward. But to the um, the larger the death, we try to avoid. Um, we 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 look forward to new year because new year is something. It's a new year. It's a new you and you are changing into something else supposedly 
and that, that is anyway that is the idea that we have so every we look forward to the new year we look forward to our birth days and uh, but when it comes to that itself we just try to avoid it so if you look at new year um, you know so there are two ways of looking at it many people actually uh, in, in Tibetan sort of like uh, sort of uh, culture in, in, in Tibetan uh, tradition um, in, uh, in many uh, in society in Tibetan society many people who are actually practitioners they usually don't really look forward to the new year because the new year just means is a reminder that you are getting much one year older one year closer to your death uh, this is one way of looking at it another way of looking at if you can look at new year and smile at it then you can also learn to look at death and smile at it also because just like a new year a new year brings end to the present year and then uh, w when a new year begins a new time begins and a new dawn begins and a new you begins so to speak similarly a death is also like that with a with a death when you die uh, you make an end to a certain chapter in your life and then you begin new a new a fresh so in that and in, in in this regard if you can if you if you do not want to welcome and smile at death then you should not look at new years you should not welcome new years with a smile if you are looking forward to a new year to a birthday to a new day then you should also be able to uh, um, train yourself to look forward to death as well so let me conclude today's teaching by one quote from Bishop Ottawa uh, so it's on page number 58 uh, this was somebody asked uh, Bishop Ottawa uh, for instructions uh, advice or instruction on how to dispel adverse circumstances obstacles hindrances you know how to dispel adverse circumstances and Geshe Potova answered with the following words uh, think about uh, death and impermanence for a long time keep thinking until it makes a subtle certain change in, in your minds in, in your mental stream in your, your in, in your mind in your mental continuum <clears throat> think about death and impermanence for a long time once you are certain that uh, you're going to die you will no longer find it hard to put aside harmful actions nor it will be difficult to do what is right and after that um, as I said before if you do the right thing and if you avoid the wrong things then the uh, positive karmas will increase and negative karmas will de decrease and then your uh, obstacles will also de uh, decrease so after that meditate for a long time on loving uh, kindness and compassion love and compassion once love fills your heart you will no longer find it hard to act for the benefit of others when your heart is filled with love uh, to care for others uh, will not be a difficulty for you then meditate for a long time on emptiness the natural state of all phenomena once you are fully understand once you fully understand emptiness you will no longer find it hard uh, to dispel all your delusions so so to dispel all forms of obstacles or obscurations begins with um, in, in, uh, reflection contemplation on impermanence once you have that you have uh, once you reflect on impermanence and death we know death is when you reflect on impermanence impermanence uh, eventually leads to death and uh, when you reflect on that everything becomes trivial and then you will do only the rightful things and avoid all the wrongful things there was a saying uh, from the uh, uh, a stoic sage I think it's Marcus Aurelius or some someone I don't remember exactly who he was uh, who it was but it was a stoic you know uh, master uh, so so he said uh, that 
think of yourself as death, de dead. You know, you have died. You are no longer in this world anymore. So what has remained? So when you die or when you are at deathbed, only the most important things will come to your mind. Only the most important things will come, come up. None of the trivial things. Right? So think of yourself as death. And whatever has remained, this is your goal. This has to be your pursuit. And work on that. So in a similar way, so when faced with death, when faced with the end, you know, when we have a deadline, then we work very hard. Similarly, when we are faced with death, when we are faced with conclusion, then we will put all our efforts to do what is the most important and leave out all the, you know, non, the trivial things. So, <clears throat> um, I will conclude here with this quote from Geshe Fatawa. Q&A. Okay, okay, Ramjela, we have a one question right now. Sure. I'll read the question. Ashray to Ramjela, to meditate on permanence every day, uh, it seems difficult to fully convinced, um, to fully be convinced. Would you please give us the wisdom on doing that? Thank you, Ramjela. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, very good question again. Um, very relevant. Um, so, um, if you remember, uh, I mean, I, I just shared the uh, quote from Master Geshe Potawa, who said, think about death and impermanence for a long time. So, long time doesn't mean, uh, you know, you have to think it for 40, 50 years or like, you know, the time itself is not of importance here. It is about, as I said before, uh, if you read many of the texts, it will say something like, think it for a long time. So, it's not about the time itself that is important. <clears throat> uh, it is about uh, how much you are able to digest, uh, how much it is able to move you. So there is no time limit as to how much is a long time. Maybe it is 50, 60 years, maybe it's 100 years, or maybe it's just a few, few, few days or a few, few months, and then you have it, right? So um, meditate, uh, uh, contemplating on death and, Im death and impermanence for a long time is the key here. As Master Potowa said, contemplating on a long time is the key here. So now what is a long time? Is it two months, two years, 20 years, 200 years, whatever? So the key here is not about the time limit itself, the time frame itself. It is about... Uh, <clears throat> uh, mm, how it affects your mind stream, how it affects your mental stream. So right now you are uh, stuck. You are stuck in samsara, not your physical body alone, uh, but your mindset is also stuck in the samsaric lifestyle. You want you to you know, do this, that, that, all the plannings, blah, 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 all these things, you know, your, your relationship, uh, your career, your money, all these things. Um, of course, it's very important. You have worked so hard for all these things. So these I'm not saying, you know, just do away with everything. Uh, but the thing is, it is yours. Uh, there are two ways of looking at it, you know. Uh, from one point of way, all the hard, all your relationships, all your career, all the careers that you have or had, all your positions, your property, your money, everything, you work so hard for it, so therefore it is yours. Another way of looking at it is, from another perspective, nothing is yours. That, uh, or, 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 or to put it another way, on the ultimate scale, nothing is yours. All these things that you work so hard for, the moment you stop breathing in and out, it will be handled by someone else. It could be someone you love, or it could be someone you despise. Your property, your relationship, everything will be taken care of by somebody else. Even your name can be used or misused by someone else. So, nothing is yours. We are just lending it. We are just leasing it. We are 
His Holiness put it very beautifully. Like he said, we are a guest living in a guest house for you know maximum of 175 to 100 years. So we are guests. We do not own the house. We are just passerbys. We are travelers. Hmm. We. <clears throat> so the important thing is not to be. Uh, so see, if, if we realize that we are passerbys, we are a guest, we are a traveler. When we travel, we don't carry everything. You know, we put most of our belongings in our in our own home or house. When we travel, we we carry one bag or two bag, maximum uh, two large bags and one carry carry on because this is what the airplane allows us, anyways, right? So no, we don't carry more than three bags, most of us. So in that three bag, we usually put all the important things that we need on our journey. Uh, similarly, if you realize that we are travelers, we are traversing, we are passerbys, we are not here for permanent, then we will pick up only the things that is important for us, and then we will not get, we, we will not, uh, you know, um, uh, we will not be attached to the things, to the possessions, to everything that is around us. Of course, not being attached doesn't mean letting everything, just giving up everything. It means simply what it suggests, not attached. So attachment is, you know, when we are attached to something, we, we are not physically attached to anything. When we have a large you know, when we have a lot of money, we're not touching, we are not uh, putting our hands on all our money like this. We are, you know, even even people who are very rich, who have like millions and millions of dollars, they're not holding their millions of dollars like this, you know. They have it in their bank account, in their properties, their this and that, everything. And it's, it, it, is, it is a property, it is a real estate, it is in real estate, it's an investment, whatever, whatever. You know, you're not like physically attached to that. When we talk about attachment, we are talking about mental attachment. So this is something very difficult for us to let go of. And once you let go of that, it doesn't mean you just give away everything. Physically, everything will be there. If you want to use your millions, if you want to use your, you know, whatever position that you have, you can still use them. It is at your perusal. It is at your service. These are your properties, so they will serve you. You are their master, right? But if you are attached to them, then you become their slave, and they become your 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 wealth, whatever, whatever, your relationship, everything becomes your master. Um, so once you let go of attachment. So attachment is big issue by itself. It's a big, very big, a big, big topic, but on on its own. So the the best way to loosen up on attachment is to reflect on impermanence. So as Keshe Buddha said, reflecting on impermanence for a long time. So a long time, as I said before, whenever it make a subtle change change in your mental uh, attitude, then the long the, the, the you know. The long time is done. It can be only two months. It can be only two days. You know, sometimes when our loved and near ones die, when when we lose all our money and all that, then you know we become devastated, devastated, and then uh, you know we just uh, plunge into practicing dharma and this and that. So it doesn't take a very long time. It takes maybe just a few days or a few months. Uh, but for many of us, so one thing is, one thing the Kadamba master used to say is that do not put a space as big as a, do not put as big a space as, 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 as big as a, um, how do you call that thing? Mm. Between your practice and yourself, don't put a space so big that a person can pass through. What it actually means is, 
your practice and yourself should become somewhat intertwined. In other words, to put it simply, make it personal. So if you think, oh, John is going to die, Tashi is going to die, Tashi, Tashi's mother died, you know, Dorje died, or you know, Michael is sick, it becomes, you are actually detaching yourself, you are actually distancing yourself from the death of that person, you are actually making it impersonal. But when it happens, when you reflect on the deaths of your own loved ones, then it becomes personal and much closer. And the more personal it becomes, the more closer it gets, uh, the more powerful, more effective the practice becomes. That is one of the reasons why Milarepa was able to become get enlightened in one life life, uh, lifespan, because it, it it was personal for him. You know, he he had a very hard life. He had to take revenge on his uncle and aunt, and. Uh, you know, he, he and since he was not a spectator but a participant in the whole game, so to speak. So he, it, it was very personal for him. So he repented. Uh, so so he has a he, he has a huge stake in that game. It's a personal stake. So to make things work much quicker, you have to make it personal. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bichai. Yeah. Um, so we will do the dedication now. Yeah, one day, yeah, you're the one, the Lama, thank you.